welcome to Seen Through Glass. Welcome back to my Audi RS6. I've owned this car now for I think three weeks and I've already done 1500 miles on it. So I thought today I'd kind of update you on my initial impressions because it's not all been smooth sailing. But don't worry, things are largely positive. And I'm happy to report after a few weeks, I still love the way this car looks, especially with that Goodwood green paint, the cognac brown leather interior. Every time I get out of it, I look back at it or I take photos of it. Every time I'm walking up to it to get in it, I'm excited. I'm like, how is this my car? These are things that were missing, sadly, with my previous daily, the BMW X3. Whether it's parked here on the side of the road in the middle of the countryside or in the centre of town, this kind of looks right. Yes, it's thuggish and purposeful, but it's also stylish and, dare I say it, sometimes even elegant. When I unveiled this car, I mentioned there were a few things I might want to change on it because I didn't actually spec it from factory. That was the brake calipers, changing them from red to maybe silver or black, and then the black trim around the windows and the front end of the car, possibly switching that back to the kind of standard satin aluminium finish. But now having spent some time with the car and staring at it a whole load and taking a ton of photos of it, I don't think I want to change a thing. The spec just comes together really nicely. I mean, just, just look at it. It's fantastic. Well, I'm pleased to report I've been enjoying spending time inside this RS6 just as much as I've been enjoying spending time outside of it, taking photos of it. Uh, I've already mentioned this cognac brown leather, which I love. It's the cabin in general. It's a really nice place to be. It's, it's simple, but effective. We might come back to that later, but really my favourite thing about this car is its driving position. It's just so big and wide and powerful, and those are all things we're probably going to come back to as well, that when you're sitting behind the wheel, you feel big and powerful and wealthy. I'm not actually that wealthy. I think most of you will know this car essentially belongs to the bank. I financed it with Magnitude Finance, but it doesn't really matter because when you're behind the wheel and you hear the engine and the exhaust burbling, you just feel like money. It's probably all the money that I'm burning at the petrol station. <laughs> Something else we'll definitely be coming back to, but yeah, it's, it's a very nice feeling to be behind the wheel of this car. And I wanna, I wanna try and let you share in that feeling for a second. So let me, let me start it up. Cause I think when you hear that engine turn on that rumble, that roar, you'll know what I mean. It kind of flows through your body. Are you ready? I hope you're sitting down. Everything just comes to life got that roar and it's like yes I could take on the world so let's go and do that Now I did say it's not all been smooth sailing with this car, what I'm about to say might surprise you. Um, it surprised me. It's the fact that sometimes, yes sometimes, this car doesn't feel that quick. Now you might be thinking, oh come on Sam, what a ridiculous thing to say. You're spoiled, you get to drive too many fast supercars, your, your point of reference all skew if. You might be right, but this car does have 600 horsepower. It's supposed to be able to do 0 to 60 in three and a half seconds. It's renowned for being ballistic. And I kind of thought that, well, yeah, the minute I got into a twisty country road, it would just come to life and I'd be like, oh my God. But actually most of the time, I find the engine to be quite lethargic. The gearbox a bit slushy. It's quite a big disconnect between me and anything that's going on. The, Accelerator pedal seems to have quite a big dead zone. The steering, I don't know, it's, it's responsive, but lacking of really any feeling. I'm sort of trying to analyze this as if it were a purpose-built, track-focused weapon. It's a daily estate car, so actually, the fact that it's a little bit sort of slushy in areas 
suits me. It's just the reputation that preceded this car. The fact that everyone thinks of it as being this complete battleship. And initially I thought it was too, but yeah, spending time with that, I'm like, it's quick. It's really quick. But sometimes I'm just like, oh, come on car, wake up. Can't think of the exact situations, but it's just been at moments that, yeah, it's not always been as responsive as, as maybe I thought it was going to be. I'm back on the side of the road because I want to quickly talk through a couple of other things that have surprised me with this car. First and foremost, the elephant in the room, fuel economy. Now, if you follow me on Instagram or listen to my podcast, Behind the Glass, you'll know I've been talking about this quite a lot because, yeah, it has surprised me just how bad the fuel economy is in this car. Maybe it shouldn't have been a surprise. Maybe I should have done more research. I mean, it's a huge V8 engine in a big heavy car. It was never going to be doing 50 MPG, was it? But I regularly see single figure MPG in and around town. And the onboard trip computer is telling me that over the last 1500 miles, I've averaged 18.8 MPG. And with fuel prices as high as they are, it's a bit of a bitter pill to swallow because it means every couple of days I'm putting 150 quids worth of fuel in this thing. I mean, the finance payments on this are high enough. That added expenditure is making this car quite expensive to run. Anyway, maybe it's something I'll get used to. Maybe as fuel prices hopefully eventually come down, it will be a little bit more bearable. But yeah, not great. Uh, anyway, then we move on to the infotainment system. Now, I mentioned the fact that I love the kind of design of this cabin, and I, I really like the design of the infotainment system. It's kind of split across two screens in this kind of central console here. You've also got the virtual cockpit, so lots to kind of interact with. But I just don't find it necessarily as kind of straightforward as the BMW system I had in my X3. There's just some functionality that I'm like, ah, oh, this doesn't seem good. For example, and maybe other Audi owners here can help me out. If I'm driving and I've got my Apple CarPlay going, I can't seem to find a way to switch from Apple CarPlay to the radio without having to push this radio icon here. And because there are no buttons, because that's a haptic touch, touch screen, it's just a bit fiddly. And as I'm driving, I feel like I'm kind of looking down here a lot. There must be a button somewhere. There must be a way just to be able to do it through the steering wheel. I have tried using the voice activated controls, which I used a lot in the BMW. But it's just not that good in this car. So yeah, that's that's been frustrating me. Also, so another example, if I want to put my heated steering wheel on, which I have done recently as it's been quite cold, I've got to go into this kind of sub setting menu down here, then it's up there on that other screen. And well, as I say, if I'm driving, that's a lot of pushing lots of different things and looking away from the road. Surely there's got to be a button somewhere on the steering wheel to do that. I mean, it makes no sense. So yeah, just things that I'm having to figure out and get used to, it's taken me a bit of time to figure out and get used to, it doesn't always seem that natural. That's definitely enough complaining though, because fundamentally, I am loving having this thing as my daily. Okay, the running costs are quite a bit higher than I was expecting. That's probably my fault for not doing the research than the car's fault. And I haven't quite gelled with the infotainment system yet, but I'll get used to it, I'm sure. Maybe it's just not as intuitive as the BMW system. That's fine, I can, I can get over that because the car makes up for it in so many other ways. As I mentioned, this is a thing to have in front of your house as a thing to drive day to day. It's hilariously cool. It's just un the feeling I get behind the wheel. It's very special and for me, it's so important that any car I own has that inherent special feeling, even if it's got a few minor downsides. Unfortunately, my wife Vicky's still not a fan. One of her biggest complaints is how big it is and I have to kind of give her that. The car is massive and there have been times that I've been thinking maybe an RS4 would have been a more sensible choice but the size the stance of the rs6 is part of its appeal and actually i mentioned it when i was on the hunt for my next daily i do always tend to seem to need a big car to put lots of stuff in and that's really even been proven in the last couple of weeks that i've had this 
car. I've loaded up with furniture from my parents' house, a load of rubbish to take to the tip, just endless stuff filling in. And oh my God, the R6 can consume so much stuff. So the practicality is actually a big tick for me, even if it means width restrictions and some parking spaces in London. Oh, a little bit of a headache. To, to run around this car on a daily basis feels like, a, uh, like I've achieved something. It's a pat on my back saying, well done, Sam. You worked hard. Now you get to drive this completely ludicrous but very cool car around. <laughs> so, yes, I had planned by this stage to have taken it on a bit of an adventure, but a few commercial projects have got in the way, uh, and I've also been a little bit under the weather, not COVID, thankfully. Uh, so this was just a bit of an update to let you know how I've been getting on. Hopefully the next kind of main... RS6 video will be with it just destroying the continent somewhere just absolutely eating up miles through France or Italy or headed into Wales etc so stay tuned for that if you have any specific questions anything you want to know about this car let me know in the comments section below stay subscribed for plenty more videos to come